I, uh, you know, this time of the year, I think a lot of you have already seen me. I'm not sure who has, so I retain some of the stuff that I've used this winter, and I have some new things in here. I sort of get tired of getting given the same presentation, so last night at, while I was preparing way in advance at 10 o'clock last night, I jammed a bunch of stuff in here. We'll kind of see how it comes out. All right. Um, just some bookkeeping, bookkeeping reminders. We still do this every year. Um, you can buy it in county offices, most of them. You don't have to buy it. You can go to our website, which is u.osu.edu slash osuweeds, and always get a free PDF there, right, to put on iPads or other devices. Um, this is that blog site, which has links to basically all the fact sheets we do, links to our YouTube page, um, links to label sites, links to the weed control guide. I do blog occasionally if you, ha if you don't. Subscribe to this, and you can click the little thing that says subscribe somewhere on there. And I don't blog very much, so it won't be painful. But you'll get an email notification. And the one this week is called uh, uh, Misleading Herbicide Ads in the People's Court. So um, it's kind of an interesting one. I took a little bit of liberty um, with some uh, misuse of our data in a herbicide ad. So it's a little bit amusing, I think. But anyway, um, this folder is also floating around. Uh, all the people who come through. Uh, pesticide recertification on that third year are getting this. Um, it's been at various other meetings. I didn't bring a bunch here, but I can certainly get some to you. We did this last year. It's got about eight different fact sheets in the herbicide site of action chart in it and things like that. If you want any of those, let me know and I can get some to you. Um, so I want to start off kind of broadly here and remind you about uh, a couple things relative to our whole weed control situation as we move into new technology, right? Uh, one of the comments I got at a meeting a couple years ago is what's the next after having talked about mare's tail and giant ragweed and palmer amaranth, the question I got after that was, what's the next weed issue we're going to have to face? And my response was, I think you kind of got your hands full here for a while still, right? Um, but as we get into new technology, one of the things to keep in mind is the weeds that we struggle with, especially in soybeans, we struggle with because they're very well adapted to our production system. It's not just because they have a tendency to develop resistance and also multiple resistance to whatever you throw at them. They're just very well adapted, a combination of uh, extended periods of emergence, adapted very well to no-till, also conventional till, uh, in some cases very prolific seed production, a lot of genetic diversity. So one of the things to keep in mind as you design programs with new technology is focusing on these weeds. Given that we have a relatively comprehensive herbicide program in place, these are still going to be the weeds that we have to spend the most effort and time on for a couple of different reasons to come up with a control program it has the right complexity and the right um, aspects to control them and also make sure over time we're not overusing certain sites of action because they will continue to adapt over time to burn out anything that we throw at them repeatedly, right? So that's something to kind of generally keep in mind. So all this new technology we have, right, it's all great. And, and um, I sound like Donald Trump there. I don't know. It's all great. It's going to be great, right? Got lots of great people, right? Um, I wasn't going to do any political stuff, but there you have it right there, right? Um, you got Extend, you got Enlist, you got Balanced GT coming, you got some other stuff coming. So, so those of you who've done a relatively decent job on weed control with current technology, you, know, you can take this technology, I think, and make it last a long time. You can also burn it out uh, pretty fast if you really want to. So just kind of keeping in mind as we move forward with all of this, making sure you're not overusing certain things and oversimplifying your programs, right? One of the things to keep in mind here um, is that uh, over time, especially over probably the past 10 years, having corn in the rotation and the herbicides that we've used corn has largely saved us from sitting in the biggest soup of herbicide resistance you can imagine, right? It's been very important. Triazines, HPP, HPPD inhibitors like Balance and Callisto, the fact that we typically have more often used growth regulators in season there, right, compared to soybeans, and now we can use growth regulators uh, essentially everywhere. So one of the first things I, I think to keep in mind here is um, having that having saved us as we move into new technology, keep that in mind, right? So if you kind of keep, keep with that same uh, strategy of trying to use different herbicides in corn and different traits in corn versus the traits we're using in soybeans, that's sort of step number one in my mind to keep us out of trouble. And um, you know, as you start to look at, at the overlap that you can do here, it's been a little bit difficult to overlap, but as we get into di dicamba and 2,4-D um, and the ability to use those posts both in corn and soybeans and then something to like Balance GT, right, where you can use Balance and then possibly Callisto also in soybeans, those are really important herbicides for us in corn. So if we start all of a sudden just bleeding that over and deciding to use everything everywhere, it's certainly going to 
um, kind of put a kink in that. And, and one of the reasons I say that, and I think most of you know I'm pretty blunt, is companies do a lousy job of storing their own products and technology, right? And so I don't think you can count on them to come out and say, okay, we have balanced GT beans, not picking on bear here, I could substitute anything else here. Um, so go ahead and use balance in beans, and then by the way, still use Corvus and corn. Right, so I think you know it's difficult to get them to say that because they have to sell stuff. It's something to keep in mind. Um, there's actually kind of a hierarchy in decision making here um, that I think all of us, if, if you're a CCA and you make recommendations, if you're a dealer agronomist, you make recommendations. If you're with Extension at our level, I think we sort of need to all get on the same page here. It'd be good if we did in terms of this hierarchy in decision making. Of first of all, more diverse crop rotation is good. The corn soybean rotation doesn't really do much for us, and we control except the ability to use different herbicides. We're basically selecting for the same weed populations there, but if you can get weed in there and other things, and then this whole, ro this whole rotation and of herbicide traits and the herbicides that we actually use, which I sort of covered. And, and you know, one of the ways to think about this, we've done this a couple of different ways. You know, a couple of years ago, we trotted out the, um, those tables I put together where you listed the herbicide program and you figured out which site of action you had on which weeds and all this. Um, and you can certainly do that, or you can kind of back off and say, okay, for those problem weeds that I specifically mentioned there, giant ragweed, water hemp, palmer amaranth, and mare's tail, how many times am I spraying them with the same foliar applied herbicides over four years? It's not that hard. You can kind of sit down and go through that and say, okay, I'm using glyphosate too much, I'm using dicamba too much, um, or something like that. And one of the problems we get into there is, given that the year of corn is sort of a gimme, if you want to look at it that way from a selection standpoint, um, we're guilty of using the same traits in soybeans repeatedly, right? So it's easy for me to say, okay, well, this year use Liberty Link beans. Two years from now, use Extend. Two years from then, um, use Enlist, and then use the right herbicides there so you're not overusing certain products. And I know what I'm up against there is that only certain companies promote Liberty Link and sell very much Liberty Link. And from a sales standpoint, you like to buy, I'm not going to pick on you here, but you're sitting right here, seed consultant seed, and seed consultants only emphasizes certain traits, or Pioneer or Monsanto. So, so I know what some of the obstacles are there, but really in terms of making technology and the herbicides that we use, um, last a long time, that's really sort of what we're up against, right? You can make them last a long time with the right type of rotation. And I'll talk about water hemp here a little bit, and the bottom line is if you have a weed like water hemp and you don't do that, every three years you're going to burn out another herbicide site of action, right? So that's kind of the bottom line. And kind of where we fit here, of course, is that these are the weeds that pop up in our end-of-the-year survey. I've shown you some of these data before, but this year in 2016 we actually uh, got through or, or drove by and surveyed over 5,000 fields. We do a transect across 52 counties, right? And we stop, you know, we go every 10 miles, we do so many soybean fields um, at the end of the season to get a picture of what's happening. This year, giant ragweed was in 15% of the fields. Uh, Mare's tail is still king here at 26%. We do pick up common ragweed in areas, and I'll show you the pigweed uh, data here in a second. Um, you know, so that's, that's the overall, and then if you really boil it down to the number of fields where we have moderate to severe infestations of this, these, it's down in about the 5 to 8 percent range. Um, this number up here has actually been pretty, pretty good and pretty consistent where 50 to 60 percent of the fields in our survey are weed free at the end of the year, and another 20 to 30 percent really only have a few weeds. So, you know, there's kind of two sides to the herbicide resistance thing. One is the sky is falling on certain people, but it's falling on other, you know, on fairly rapidly and on others not near as fast. Um, you know, 90% of our fields don't have that many weeds in them, so the overall picture, I think, is pretty good. Um, having said that, we, we certainly have areas and fields that are a major concern. So if you look at that, 15% for giant rag, 26% for mare's tail. Um, this, is, this is down from 2013 with 23% in ragweed and 35% in mare's tail, and, uh, and of course, as the weed scientist for the state, I take full credit for that reduction in populations, <laughs> right? Um, I, I would hope our education has something to do, to do with that. I, I would say it's a credit to all of you who adopt the right recommendation and make recommendations to, uh, to get those numbers down, so kudos to you. Um, the pigweed and water hemp are picking up. Um, we, we, this past year, for the first time, um, picked up water hemp sort of randomly in the survey. Palmer amaranth we have not picked up randomly in the survey. We know where the Palmer amaranth is because people tell us about it. Um, but water hemp we can pick up randomly now in certain areas. And what you see with pigweed is sort of an emphasis in the northwestern part of the state and in the west central part of the state, right? And a little bit in the south central. But 
Uh, part of that is a pickup in water hemp, and part of that is after those after uh, the ragweeds and volunteer corn and mare's tail, redroot pigweed is actually the next weed we pick up in fields the most. And we've kind of surveyed that in the greenhouse to figure out if it has resistance, and it does have some, but not really much to glyphosate yet. Uh, but it's kind of curious that that is the one that pops up. Uh, I will spend some time on the pigweeds here, right? And I know um, I should kind of take a break here, and I know my major goal here right after lunch is to keep you all awake until 2 o'clock. So it's me against the meatloaf and mashed potatoes, right? right? So I will try to do that. Um, the, the pigweeds, I, I will say that in terms of identification of pigweed and that whole thing, we have a lot of stuff online. I'm not going to cover it here. We've got a fact sheet that's very good, three pages. We have about a three-minute YouTube video that I think is very good on, on amaranth identification, so make sure you look at those if you need to. Um, the pigweeds, especially the water hemp and palmer, are two weeds that scare weed scientists more than any other weeds we deal with because they're the ones that are burning through herbicide sites of action uh, faster than anything else. So those are the ones that... I think, I think until Palmer and Waterhemp came along, I think weed scientists at universities, even given our mare's tail and giant ragweed issues, were thinking, okay, we, we can handle all of this with herbicides. You know, we can manage the rotation of that um, and do well enough that, to kind of keep these in check. And I think what we're finding out about Waterhemp and Palmer Amaranth is no. Um, you know, we, we can do a very good job with herbicide rotation and rotation of traits um, and do some of that, but we're going to have to use some non-chemical methods probably somewhere in here to help keep those under control. And the bottom line is, for those herbicides, given how many times we have, or those weeds, given how many times we have to spray them, it's a lot of selection pressure, um, and, and they just are willing to adapt to that. Um, the water hemp is essentially all over the state. Um, these maps really don't tell us very much. Um, our, our main issue with water hemp right now, and some of you here know, know of, of fields that are a problem outside of this circle, but is sort of the Mercer, Van Wert, Dark, Preble, Auglaise area where water hemp is um, becoming more of a problem. And I will say that uh, while we spend a lot of time on Palmer, you know, the strategy is basically the same if you don't have water hemp to keep it out of your operation because in the end it will permanently reduce um, your profitability. Uh, but water hemp is already a bigger issue for us than Palmer and will continue to be a bigger issue. If, I, if, if you give me give me a time for another political joke, I think the equivalent here would be while we were worried about Hillary's emails, we elected this whole other thing. But you know, whatever. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm not going any farther than that, right? Okay, so I mean, the basic bottom line on water hemp is its ability to um, adapt to anything that's thrown at it. Multiple resistance in water hemp is is very common west of us. You know, the timeline where we develop mare's tail issues water hemp issues developed in Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa, uh, and now they're starting to get into, into more mare's tail and giant ragweed issues as well. So it's very common to have multiple resistance there. This is an example of resistance to trizines, PPO inhibitors like Cobra and ALS inhibitors like Raptor. So basically their assumption there is that all the water hemp is ALS resistant, so anything that's pursued classic, that type of stuff isn't going to work. Um, and, and a great majority of it is glyphosate resistant. I'll show you our numbers here in a second. And then I think the last surveys from uh, Purdue and Illinois, Illinois survey from two years ago, I assume of fields that had water hemp in them at the end of the season were 60% plus had three-way resistance, the PPO, ALS, and glyphosate, and, and Purdue had data last year. I think if anyone saw, saw Bill Johnson's talk, you could help me out. I think it was upwards of 30% of their populations had that same type of resistance. You know, so our first adaptation with water hemp of throwing in Flexstar or Cobra, you can see what, where that's going to get us. Um, a little scarier for water hemp is its ability to develop a new type of resistance mechanism. And I can't remember if I talked about this here last year, but you know our, our herbicide resistance mechanisms have been site specific so far, right? So if we have a giant ragweed plant that has resistance to both ALS inhibitors and glyphosate, it had to have two independent mutations that caused a change in a pathway, separate pathways, right, uh, simultaneously so that it developed resistance to glyphosate and then ALS inhibitors. Um, and you can see for this water hemp population from Champaign County, it has five-way resistance to ALS, PPO, HPPD, right, uh, photosystem 2 inhibitors like trizines and also 2,4-D. What they figured out was that the resistance for PPO and ALS was that target site mediated, but the resistance to the other three uh, was basically a, a one mechanism that automatically conferred resistance to all three of those types of herbicides, right? So instead of having an altered binding site, and enabled the plant to uh, have an enhanced metabolism that crossed over herbicide sites of action. 
And this is a population, as you can see here, that had previous HPPD use and triazines, I'm assuming, but really not much 2,4-D use. And if you've seen, kind of tracked any of this, you know I think Nebraska three years ago had a water hemp population with resistance at 2,4-D already, uh, right, in spite of not a lot of use. So this, this is one of the reasons water hemp makes us very nervous. I think our assumption is, is that Palmer amaranth has the capability to do the same type of thing, although that has not been identified yet, right? And one of the reasons that um, this makes us nervous is we're not sure what the right recommendation is, right? So if it's site-mediated, I can say, okay, rotate to this, and then rotate to this, and then rotate to that. If you're going to have a mechanism that once it develops resistance to HPPD, automatically confers resistance to a couple other sites of action, it's a little more difficult to figure out what the recommendation is, right? Uh, where we sit right now, and I know these are busy slides, but uh, the mark of any good extension presentation is at least a few slides that nobody can interpret, right? So anyway, um, these are our populations from 2014. Um, we had 19 red root, 14 water hemp, and then seven, seven palmer amaranth. Um, and, and the data here are from a resistance to a 4X, and then I pulled out the 1X glyphosate rate. Most of the palmers resistant to glyphosate. It's all ALS resistant. We picked up a, a hint of PPO resistance. The red root pigweed, I, I called this resistant to 1X glyphosate rate. We went back to try to confirm it, and Illinois worked with it too, and we couldn't confirm glyphosate resistance. I would say in red root pigweed, we're picking up something going on with glyphosate, right? It seemed to be some populations that at times have a reduced response. Um, and these are, again, from our survey, most of these randomly, but over half was ALS resistant, and there was a little bit of PPO resistance. Our water hemp, all of it was resistant to glyphosate, especially the use rate. Essentially all ALS resistant, about a quarter of it PPO resistant. And then this is populations from 2015. Um, Palmer's not on here. Our latest screen of Palmer this winter, it's all glyphosate resistant again. Um, so we're picking up a little bit with glyphosate, uh, ALS, and PPO in the red root. And here's your water hemp. It's essentially uh, three-quarters of it resistant to a use rate of glyphosate, all ALS resistant, and a little bit less of the PPO resistant. So you can see the tendency for the, uh, the water hemp and palmer to develop multiple resistance, right? I will tell you that if you're dealing with water hemp or as you get into dealing with water hemp, one of the best things to do first uh, is to try to figure out if it has glyphosate and PPO resistance. We're assuming it's all ALS resistant, right? Um, but U of I does this for 50 bucks per field, and a, and a field includes up to five plants. And what you do is um, cut off leaves, overnight them to Illinois, give them the 50 bucks, and they'll, and they'll do a screen, quick screen, um, to tell you whether it's uh, resistant to Flexstar type materials and also glyphosate. It's important, obviously, because if you, if you have that type of resistance and you don't know it, and you come back assuming, okay, glyphosate still works, or Flexstar still works. You plan on that, you come out, spray it, and it doesn't work, you're going to have a big mess and, and basically not be able to control it. So I, I think it's a pretty good investment. Um, last conversation I had with them, they said, allow us two weeks. So in terms of a, of a planning and how to use this, I suppose if you had water had plants up early enough, you could get it over to them. Um, in soy, water hemp plants up early enough in soybeans, get this over to them and get it done in time to do the uh, make a post decision. I'm not really sure that's the right way to do it. Uh, but for sure, the previous year in corn, right, or in beans, if you have water hemp, even if it's late season, you're trying to figure out what's going on with it, you know, sample the leaves and, and give them the money and get the inf information. So um, the control programs here, you know, one of the things about both these weeds is it's a combination of having to adapt your herbicide program to with the weed as it adapts resistance, and then the fact that both of these have prolonged periods of emergence they tend to have to be sprayed when they're very small to be controlled. Palm are less than three inches tall, water hemp a little bigger than that. So it makes for a relatively complicated herbicide program, residual up front. The first post on small plants, and one of the things about the size here is, is we're on a new learning curve, right? So our learning curve for Maristale has been, well, this is at least my impression of it, one way to explain it is, your learning curve for Maristale has been up front, right? Fall applications, spring applications with the right residual, so we don't have to worry about it post, or you can use uh, Liberty Link beans. Now we've shifted, so water hemp and Palmer is a very post-centric philosophy, even if you've used residual up front. So it's a matter of, okay, how much residual do I use? Um, how, how do I manage that so I'm spraying it when it's small enough? And, and the difference is, um, if it gets too big, you essentially won't control it. And I think those of you who work with water hemp already in that area are finding that out as you work with customers, right? Guys, that, people that got in there too late uh, just aren't getting it. Um, so your options here, obviously, are Flexstar from Esafin, 
um, and non-GMO and Roundup Ready. If it's glyphosate resistant, you can add glyphosate to that. Uh, glufosinate, Liberty Link beans, the whole Extend system. You will have the um, Enlist system as well. Um, and then if you need a second post, uh, you can come back with that. One of the things about a couple of these systems, especially the Extend, is you know, the Extendamax and Ingenia labels on, on uh, Extend beans are up to R1. Right? So if you have to make a second post application, you'll basically be off-label on most of those fields. Am I thinking anyway, right? R1's what? Mid-June, third week of June? Something like that. So you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have to switch to something else like a Cobra Phoenix or something like that if you have to make a second application. Um, residual herbicides for water, hep and palmer, strongest approach is two. Something that has two non-ALS products. Again, we're assuming it's all ALS resistant, so you can use you know, Valor XLT or Authority XL or something like that that has Clearmuron or Clansolam in it as an ALS, but that won't help on the water hemp. So your strongest approach is something that has a couple different actives that, that, that have activity on water hemp or Palmer, and I've got some examples here. Um, that's sort of your Cadillac start. The other start would be just to go with something down here, um, a single product. The difference is, um, and I, I think this is probably evident, self-evident, you know, but the difference is, uh, how long you get control, um, how long it keeps plants small, and what kind of a flexibility you get in your post window with this approach, right, uh, versus this approach down here. The other adaptation that's been made for Palmer and water hemp that's increased the cost of the program um, has been adding residual to the first post, right, so that you don't have to spray post again, um, or possibly uh, even going out with a residual before you make your post to try to keep the whole thing manageable. So this is a strategy that we've not talked about much because it's useless for mare's tail and giant ragweed. So if you have somebody trying to sell you a residual in your post largely to help you out with either of those two weeds, it's a waste of money, but it's pretty effective for these. And you've got um, options, the Zidua, the pyroxysulfone, anything that has that in it, metallochlor, dual type products. You can also do something like a prefix, which is dual plus, plus sulfamesaphone and then the Warrant and the Warrant Ultra. So that's been, again, one of the modifications. You know, for Palmer especially, the, the increased has, cost has come from uh, possibly multiple post applications, adding residual to the post, um, a more aggressive uh, pre-program, and then it comes up late season. So the other reason for increased cost has been, like in places like Tennessee, they've had to spray Gramoxone after corn harvest because they have a bunch of new plants lurking down there that still have time to produce seed. All right, so that's been the, that's been why that program costs so much, and, and water hemp certainly has some of that. That's without a cover crop. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for asking that. Um, so the the recommendation has been, um, and I'll show you a couple of different data slides here. Um, cover crops, and we worked with cereal rye. We had a regional study that worked with cereal rye and a couple other cover crops. This is a standard recommendation now from the University of Tennessee, right? And that recommendation is if you have Palmer amaranth. Um, plant wheat or cereal rye mixed with vetch or crimson clover uh, because the, the research shows that that'll reduce um, Palmer amaranth, and I'll show you the data here. E even without residual herbicides, that'll reduce Palmer amaranth emergence by up to 50%, right? And then the other thing they have here is um, terminating at planting, and they've got some data here. I know this is impossible to show. I kind of had to squint my eyes at it last night. Uh, but basically shows the longer you leave it in there, um, the, the more time you have until Palmer reaches four inches tall. And we've seen the same thing with mare's tail, where you obviously have to make a decision on when to terminate a cover based on your soil type, your situation, your spring weather, and things like that, right? But the data pretty clearly shows for covers, the longer you can leave them in there, the more that will extend your control after planting, and that's what their data are showing here. Um, and, and basically it's showing here that, um, back to your question, so here's, here's, how, here's where the cover's improving. Um, control and this was part of the study we did so you can see here's a control from the cover without any residual herbicide with a pre and then with the with the pre and the post and now the other way that we did this and the bar on the left is as I just realized about impossible to see here but this was the regional study so we had water hemp and palmer sites and we had a couple different herbicide programs we had non-treated we had a, a pre followed by a post with residual and then we had a very aggressive program pre followed by post with residual with another residual, and, and you can essentially see the herbicide programs uh, worked okay. They actually worked better on Palmer than water hemp, but what I wanted to point out here was, um, and, and the cover really didn't affect the performance of the herbicide programs per se because they were so aggressive, but if you come down here and look at the number right here where the cereal rye was given close to 40% control on its own 21 days after planting. And so the thinking I think really uncovers is 
They're certainly not going to replace herbicides, and they're not recommending a less aggressive herbicide program. The thinking is it keeps the post window more manageable, and it's also reducing the number of plants that we have to spray with the post herbicides, which is important. Why? Because of what I just said about selection pressure, right? Trying to make things last as long as they can. So that's, that's where the value of the cover crop is. I think they're the first ones really to standard, make a standard recommendation here, but you'll hear more from us about that as well. Um, that's just 42 days after planting, and you can see obviously the whole thing dropped down. So 42 days after the rise, not giving you the same level of control. All right. Um, questions about any of that real quick? I didn't put this up here just so you got two shots of me, one there and one here. That wasn't why I did that. Okay. Uh, we just, I just, I'm just letting you know we just did a new 10-minute update video on Palmer Amaranth, right? So you got anybody else that needs that information or, you, or I go through it too fast and you want to catch this again, it's on our YouTube site, which is uh, right up there. Just go to YouTube and search on that. If you go to our blog site, um, you can also, there's a link to our YouTube videos there, right? So that's got sort of a 10-minute quick and dirty. Um, and it does have this green, have this neat green screen thing at OSU we have access to. So you get to see me actually standing next to the slide through a lot of that video. So whether that's good or bad, you can kind of blank out that side if you want. Um, so again, we've got a couple, uh, aside from that, we've got video on, on uh, Palmer ID. We've got fact sheets on our website. I will give you the quick and dirty update here and the little pep talk about keeping it out and, and the recommendations for preventing it, right? Um, so this, if you remember this talk from last year, this... These boxes have gotten more numerous here, which is not a good thing, right? So this is 2012. We had it down in Scioto County, and this is kind of where we sit now in 2016. Just because I have a county uh, outline there doesn't mean that there's even really a nasty infest in, a field with a nasty infestation. It means at least a few plants have been found somewhere there. So I think we found, for example, a few plant plants in the rain. There was a patch in Sandusky that I think is under control now. I've got yours on here now where you found some and then what, buried them or whatever, so you haven't found any more, right? Okay, good. I had to pick on somebody, so, right? So, you're, so I think that's, that's, that's you all there. No, you're actually down south of there. I don't have you outlined. I took it off because you took care of it. You're here, right? Wayne, Wayne, we'll talk about Wayne in a minute. Wayne's sort of a problem child, so we'll get there in a second here. Um, but, but you can see basically we're getting more and more infestations, right? Um, so it is spreading. Hmm? Circle Lucas too? Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess I should say thank you, right? I'm not sure thank you is the right response there, right? Oh, good. I can circle Lucas too, right? Um, so the key to keeping Palmer Amaranth out, of course, is knowing how it can come in. And the main way it's come in for us so far is manure from animal operations using the cotton feed products from the south. And for lack of a more scientific definition, there's fluffy stuff and pellet stuff, right? And it can all be contaminated with Palmer amaranth. Um, and I think some of the larger animal operations have actually stopped using that. There's an economic thing to feed, and I don't know the whole feed thing, so I'm not sure they're stopping using that has been due to um, uh, actually the fear of Palmer as much as probably other things are, are more economical. But that's certainly one way it comes in. You have to assume it's in, it can be in any cotton field in the south. It's pretty widespread down there as far as I know, and I could be wrong. None of the people supplying that type of feed from the south are taking any steps to take Palmer seed out of what they're selling. I don't. So far, that's, that's, that's my conclusion there, right? Uh, equipment used in infested fields, so if you have something custom harvesting, they can move it around on combines. Um, we did have one of the fields that had to be mowed down this year in Warren County. Um, there was one field mowed down because it was so, so bad and it was along the edge of another field. So they tracked it back to a combine that had been used in both those fields that had been purchased, used from a local dealer, but had come from Georgia. Right? So one of the keys here, especially about combines, which are about impossible to completely clean out, is um, knowing where that, where that equipment's coming from. If you're purchasing it used especially, um, where, you know, where did it originate? And I would say it's not a good time to be taking equipment like that uh, from the south, right? Um, there is um, some of that can be taken care of. In Tennessee, apparently, there's an outfit that fumigates combines to kill palm ramarant seeds. So you give them 2,500 bucks, they tent the combine in methyl bromide and, uh, to take care of that seed. So I don't, I don't know anyone in the state that's doing it here. Um, and then finally, the other thing to watch out for here is contaminant and seed used for any type of crep or wildlife seeding. Um, I'll show you kind of what the situation here is in the Midwest. I will tell you that. In spite of what an Ohio Farmer article said about three weeks ago that made it look like Armageddon was happening here, 
uh, for that reason. I only know of two places where Paul Amaranth and the state got started that way. One is the guy down in Scioto County. It was a Krebs seating probably in 07 and 08. And then a large Krebs seating in Madison County several years ago where it came in and then the guy tore the whole thing up, got into a court fight with everybody. So those are the two places that I knew it came in. Having said that, you know, there's numer numerous programs that the agencies run. Um, the catch-22 on, on this is that a lot of the seed for this is produced in places like Texas, Kansas, in some cases in the south. It's not a noxious weed in, in, in the western states because it's been there forever and they've been dealing with it for a long time. It's a noxious weed here, so it's not supposed to be in seed that's sold here. But because it's not a noxious weed in Kansas, for example, the seed tag doesn't have to show if it has Palmer in it, right? And if you're thinking that's just stupid, that is the right conclusion, right? Okay? So that's the catch-22. So if you rely on seed tags to try to identify whether it has Palmer, they largely don't work. Uh, and so the, the solution here really is, and this is a great use of your tax dollars, is uh, ODA, will, ODA will screen any of the seed. They have to come pick it up. Here's a number. That was also in our core newsletter article. Apparently, the first person you talk to there isn't completely informed on this, so you can ask for Dave Simmons or Chris Holton in the, uh, in the, in the grain feed and seed division, um, and that's the best way to make sure it's not in there if you have time to do that. And, and their biggest thing really is we're willing to provide this service. No one's calling us, right, in spite of the information we've, we've put out. So that's, that's, your, uh, that's your sure way to make sure it's not in some of those seedings. Having said that, um, the one meeting I had with the conservation group, Pheasants Forever, said they have a more aggressive approach where they work with one seed vendor in Kansas every year, and that seed gets screened before it leaves the state for Palmer, right? So they apparently have a more aggressive program in place. This got big news this year because in Iowa, if you tracked any of this, Iowa went from having a few Palmer infestations in 2015, which is the brown here, to all these red ones in 2016, which was due to a pollinator seeding program. Right? So obviously this is why it made such big news, um, and that's why we're concerned about it, even though we haven't had very much. Right? So again, uh, you know, there's some steps to take here to keep it out. Um, we're trying to um, pull everybody together to have, I would say, a more aggressive or more consolidated approach among agencies and everyone um, to get that screening done, but that hasn't really happened so far. Um, so in terms of Ohio, Ohio where our major infest, infested areas are, Again, Wayne County is one of them, the Columbia, Hanna, Mahoning area. There's a couple of dairies down here. There's an area around them um, that has some infestations. The one guy down in um, Scioto that has a huge river bottom infested. It went down to the next two river bottoms. And I'll use this joke again, even though I used it here before. Then it goes to Kentucky, so we don't care at that point, right? <laughs> right? I didn't say it was a good joke. Um, so we've got so this kind of shows you where the more major fields are. I don't know about the one in the one in Lucas. I don't know uh, much about that one. In some of these cases, again, the other counties, there was an infestation. It got taken care of, and they're and they're kind of on top of it. And it shows you what our relative relative importance of the different ways that it uh, has come in. Wayne's County is a little bit interesting. Wayne County has a combination of the manure thing, the seed manure thing, a custom silage operation, and some other people moving, possibly moving around on combines. So there's so that's kind of a number of things going on there. Um, we put this in the newsletter and I think also on our blog just to get everybody's attention that there were three fields that had to be mowed down in the state this year, three soybean fields in early August because they were so contaminated with Palmer that that was really the only recommendation we could make. Right? You're, you're, you have so much seed here already, you don't have any beans in here, and you basically you're going to have so much seed uh, really that that's, that's the right thing to do. Um, there were a couple other fields near these that probably should have been mowed down. Um, and, of course, what happens when you, when you mow down a field with a tractor pulling a bush hog is what do you have two weeks later? Weeds back up, right, where you ran through them and things like that. And so the recommendation, of course, is to follow up and mow again or till or whatever. The guy down in Warren County did that. The guy up in, outside of Orville didn't, and this is what he had a month later, right? Some people, I'm not even going to go there, right? Um, so... He had all the plants that regrew, and they will, re they will re root in numerous places when they're bent over touching the soil. He also had a, all the new palmer that were down there when the beans came off, and they came back and produced seed too. So I, I only show this as a little bit of shock value, and I show it because this is what they did get into in the south when it got out of control, mowing down and tearing up lots and lots of soybean fields just so they could try to manage it in future years, right? And, of course, these guys are accidents waiting to happen, right? Um, Continuous years of beans, um, no residual herbicides, all glyphosate, you know, and then you talk to them and, you know, you hear a comment like, well, I think I had some of this last year, and I'm thinking, yeah, I bet you did, right? Um, 
So, you know, then you could get into this situation. And these are the fields actually behind the one that got mowed down outside Orville. This one here and this one across the, the road that I, I think should have been mowed as well. Uh, so he's got obviously a major problem there. So, I mean, yeah, right there, combine or the, or the guy that I think in this case, this one was custom harvested. He went somewhere else, right? Absolutely right. Yep. Um, so just kind of, uh, I know I harp on residual herbicides, and I have, and I, and I think the good news is 80-plus percent of our beans get residual herbicides. One of the reasons this is still relevant is um, I'm, I hear the comments about extend and enlist coming up of, oh, okay, I've got a dicamba I can use here. I don't need residual herbicides again, right? And, and uh, I'm not even going to tell you what my first response is to that, right, because it, um, I kind of jump up and down. My face gets red. My blood pressure goes up really, right? Um, but, you know, in terms of managing weeds, residual herbicides are still important. For water hemp and palmer amaranth, for people who don't have those weeds, they're a first line of defense. They basically give you a fighting chance so that if you get inadvertently an infestation of water hemp or palmer through one of those sources or birds or animals or whatever, you know, residual herbicides are giving you the control for the first couple months there, even four to six weeks. Palmer amaranth's going to come at you all season. You can see the emergence pattern here at a site over in Indiana. Water hemp cuts off probably somewhere in here. So what you're hoping is the residual herbicides last long enough. I get some palmer coming up here or water hemp. I have time in late season to scout and pull them out before they produce seed. And I think it largely works. And I think about um, the, your area down there where residual herbicides are used on those fields. And when we go scout those fields in August, the ones that we've scouted, we don't find plants with seed yet. So you've got that window uh, to pull plants out before they get seed. And, of course, what those guys had was previous years of infestation, no residual it was game over from the start, right? Because I think the first time someone's probably going to find Palmer, especially is, is late season when it comes through their herbicide program, right? That's probably the first time they're going to find it. So you need that window to be able to pull it out before it produces seed. So bottom line is, um, we've talked about this before, keep residual herbicides in there, know what Palmer looks like, spend a little bit of time right, with our ID and the video, make sure you know what you're looking for. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's another layer of scouting. I view it as you can drive by fields in late summer a couple of times. You could use a drone. You could drive through fields. Really, whatever it takes to make sure that you're not missing some palmer, excuse me, or water hemp plants um, that might be out there, right? Um, if you come across it in a combine when you're harvesting corn because corn will hide it, right? Um, you know, stop if you don't know what it is. Don't pollute the combine. Um, you know, figure out what it is before you drive through it, so... Uh, it depends on when it comes up. The question is, when does it go to seed? So it kind of depends. I mean, if it comes up, if you don't have residual on there, it's going to be producing seed by late July. If you have residual, again, you got that it's worked. You know, that's a, that, that pushes that way out because, you know, again, the fields that we've been in in August that had residual, um, we've had difficulty finding seed in some cases until September. It's day length sensitive, so at day, a certain point, day length will trigger it to do that. All of a sudden, the mature seed's there? Or the, the plant. Yeah, right. I mean, it, yeah, uh, that's, I, think, I think that's an appropriate comment. Comment is all of a sudden it's there. And, and I, think, I think the answer to that is given that you have a comprehensive program in place, the fact that it's there, you still have time to get it before it produces seed. That's what you're counting on, right? Questions about that? Make sure I got the time right here. I have two hours, is that right? Okay, okay. All right. Um, so I, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the extend thing, and then I want to show you a little bit of other cover crop data and talk about killing cover crops, right? Um, I, I have a whole module, or we have a slide set on the stewardship, basically about an eighth slide set on the stewardship of the dicamba products. I opted not to do it here because it's kind of mind-numbing, boring to grind through, quite frankly. Uh, but it's on, our, it's on that blog site. There's a the second blog post down has links to the labels, Links to a piece from ODA, um, links to that slide set, um, links to the websites. We have links to the websites for uh, the three products, the Fexapan, the Extendamax, and the Genius. So that is there if that's helpful to you at all. I will tell you on top of that, if you are applying any of those products, know the label really well. It's kind of my, my bottom line. There's two labels. There's an overall label, and then there's a supplemental soybean label. And, and spend some time with those and make sure you know uh, what's going on there, right? So this is our current status. You got extend for this year with the products approved. And, and all of you know, of course, we're, we're waiting for those tank mixes to sort of be approved. So that's kind of, kind of the unknown. Some of those are coming through now. 
Um, we're not going to, uh, you know, update our information to have the list all those. You can go to the website and see those. So that's kind of what we're all waiting for. It makes it a little bit difficult to plan, I think. Um, the list is still, I think they're counting hopefully on next year, right? Um, I'm just going to cover options here a little bit, um, something I haven't done too much this winter, but um, this is kind of the one of the bigger questions I think I've had. And, and uh, our attitude on the whole extend thing this year is to lay a little bit low and kind of see what happens with it, get the tank mixes in place for next year, and then I think put out more specific information on that. But obviously you have different strategies that you can take here. You can buy extend beans for the genetics or because you just wanted to buy extend beans for protection against your neighbor. Um, not, not that any of your neighbors have any ineptitude there, right? Um, so you can do that and not use any dicamba. You certainly option number one. Um, one of the places dicamba has a lot of utility is in the burn down for management of mare's tail. All right, so if you look at our current mare's tail management program, and Roundup Ready Beans, for example, it is do a fall, ideally, but if you don't, you know, dirt, do a burn down that makes sure, to make sure that works and put enough residual with that, like a combination of metribuzin with a Valor or Authority product to carry you through so you don't need to spray it post, right, because you don't have the option. And Extend, you obviously have the option to spray it post, but you can still take that approach, and Dicamba is better than 2,4-D on mare's tail. That's one of the advantages there. So especially if you haven't done something in the fall, you can basically swap in the dicamba for the 2,4-D in your burn down with the glyphosate and the residual. Use enough residual to carry you through soybean canopy so you don't have to spray the, uh, the extend post. That's, that's certainly another option. I think if you look at that one in terms of damaging things that are around you, um, you know, you've got less things you can damage in late April, right, compared to, to early June. So that's certainly another option. A lot of utility there. You know, our main issue, I think, still with mare's tail, especially if we haven't done a fall application, I, I know this is the main issue, is 2,4-D has gotten a lot of variability in it over time, or that mix has gotten a lot of variability, and that's certainly one place dicamba has a lot of utility. Um, I would say beyond that, if you're planting extend beans with the hope of controlling ragweed or water hemp or palmer issues, that have developed resistance to several other types of herbicide site of action, you're going to have to use it post. I mean, that's where it has its utility to help you out oh, with giant ragweed or, or mare's tail or water hemp. Um, still need residual. Um, if you can't read that, my comment there was don't make us come looking for you, right? Um, my other one I can't say, right? It's going to be bent over so I can, you know, can ask, whatever. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, and then, you know, you can still use a standard 2,4-D sharpened type of burn down in that situation. If you decide, okay, the utility of my dicamba is in the post, you can decide, okay, I don't need it in the pre, right? I'm still going to use 2,4-D or some other type of burn down there. So there's some decisions to be made there, and you'll get uh, more information from that, I think, from us next year to give you um, some guidelines there. But certainly, I, I look at this option here for, for management of mare's tail to keep us out of trouble is certainly uh, one place that we can do that. Uh, I think I've shown some of these data before, but we got a little bit more in 2016. And I show you these data for a couple of different reasons, right? Um, these are, this is a study we did. Um, it was a bare ground study, but with dicamba applied in the burn down, dicamba to half pound with glyphosate with residual herbicides. We put them out 14 days ahead of planting. We put them out at plant. Um, the goal here really was to show the value of combining a two different non-ALS herbicides, right? So, again, backing up, the mare's tail essentially is all ALS resistant now. You've probably heard me say this before, but the ramifications of that are that if you use a Valor XLT or Fierce XLT or a Sonic or whatever, the ALS component in there, the Clansolam or the Climerlon, is the better component for residual control of mare's tail, and we basically burn it out, right? So it throws all the control back on the Valor Authority, and what we found over time was they have a lot of variability. They're not terribly long-lived. So the, um, this is the basis for our recommendation, and instead of just using Metribuzin, you add Sharpen to it, or instead of just using Valor, right, you add Metribuzin to it. Uh, Spartan is straight authority. So instead of doing like an authority XL by itself, you add Metribuzin. And you can see the bump here, specifically here, from 14 days ahead of planning application, rated in mid-June, right, which is when the post would go on. You got the straight authority at 63%, adding Metribuzin up at 96%. So that's the basis for the recommendation we largely make that, you know, in a Roundup Ready Bean, given that you can burn it down, combine a couple of different things to extend the residual, right? You're probably looking at this thinking, well, it's not legal to do an ounce and a half with Sharpen with Valor 14 days ahead of planting, and you're right, it's not. Um, what we have found out with Sharpen, though, if you can do it, is the ounce and a half has serious, considerably better residual on mare's tail than the ounce rate. So if you can figure out a way to do that 14 days ahead of planting with Metribuzin or something like that. All right? 
So again, showing that in the, in the dicamba program, you can go 14 days ahead of planning and make that work without having to use dicamba post if you can get it up to 90%. Here's what happens if you move the whole thing later. And of course, one of the messages on the whole extend thing is I don't have to wait to plant, right? I can just plant, spray the herbicides, do whatever I want to do. And there's a couple of things to consider there, but certainly doing that and moving the whole thing out later, you can see the numbers improve, right? So if I'm at 63 to 90 plus percent here, here the lowest number I have is 83 and you've got a lot more in the 90s. So basically the bottom line is being able to push that out a little bit later and apply when you plant buys you more time on the other end so your residuals last longer. You still see some of the benefit of tank mixing but not, not near as strong, right? Um, so again, if you look at where the dicamba has utility, that's certainly one way to approach that to say, okay, dicamba goes in the burn down, I'm going to put enough residual with it, I still get good control of mare's tail in mid-June. Right? I'll show you the other side of that, right? So here's another year of this, and I have to say that in this study we didn't have as much late emerging mare's tail. So if you look at the 14-day ahead of planning, you see kind of the same trends, but you see the metribuzin hanging in there. Everything just looks a little bit better. I had to leave this one out. I looked at the, you know, I rated the plots, and obviously something didn't get put in the tank. Hung over grad student. I don't know what kind of happened there, whatever it was. Anyway, threw the data out. Well, you see the same trend, and then you see if you, if you go out here, you, you sort of see the same trend, but then you start to see these lower numbers in the 80s with the asterisk, right? And what happened there was we got late enough that we started to break the dicamba a little bit. Dicamba being very good on mare's tail, what happened in that situation was the authority in the valor antagonized it somewhat, so we started to lose control of the plants that were there. Right, so I show you that for a couple reasons to show you that, uh, again, you can make that work. I mean, you can make that whole thing work by applying everything at planting and getting enough residual. But if you get a little bit late on that, um, you'll start to see some performance issues. Right? It's, not, it's not completely bulletproof. So. And that, that, of course, kind of leads back to the whole fall versus spring application thing where the other thing I think that comes up is, oh, I've got enough burn down for mare's tail here, so I'm going to stop doing fall applications. Right? Does so everybody remember why we started doing fall applications in the first place? Was it for mare's tail? Yeah, dandelion, right? Masses of chickweed, dead nettle, just fields that were really hairy in the spring. So the, you know, there's two comments there. One is if you decide to, to opt out from the fall, it's going to make your mare's tail burn down situation always more difficult, even with something that's as good as dicamba. The second thing is we're back to that, okay, more dandelion, kind of messier spring no-till fields that possibly don't warm up as fast, don't dry out as fast, whatever. So just kind of some things to consider as you, as you move forward, right? Okay, questions about that or comments about dicamba? I take a breather. All right, I'm going to finish with a little bit of cover crop stuff. Um, usually after I, I give this talk, I have to say always after I give this talk, at this meeting, when I get done, somebody invariably comes up and says, why don't you talk about cover crops? It's a tillage conference or a no tillage conference. And so those of you who would ask that question, here's the cover crop information, right? Okay, so I think I've shown some of this before. Um, you know, and I made the comment about water, hemp, and palmer and, and the need to have some non-chemical control methods there, right, like covers. Uh, we've done some of the same work with, with mare's tail, and mare's tail uh, control responds very well to certain covers, right? Um, We've used ryegrass and rye. We've done, I think, a total of four site years. And what we did essentially here was look at uh, the timing of the kill. So we had no cover, which is basically killing it as soon as it came up in the fall, early April versus a seven-day pre-plant, um, and then with and without the 2,4-D, and then with and without residual, right? And our residual here was canopy DF plus metribuzin. So. Um, and, and, you know, some of this probably looks familiar. I was actually pretty amazed after this first year. We had two ryegrass sites. And a, rye and a rye site, and you can see averaged over all those factors, the plus and minus 2,4-D and the plus and minus residual. Without the cover, we're at 50 to 62 percent in June. Early April kill, we're at 78 to 96, and then seven-day pre-plant, we're at 92 to 99, right? So you can, you can obviously see the, the cover had an effect there, right? Um, if you break that down by the factors, um, the, and this is the biggest, one of the biggest questions I get about mare's tail control and covers is do I still need a fall application? Um, and the answer I think largely is probably not. Um, you can see if you don't have the cover, um, the fall application is obviously very important as we know. You get to a early April kill, 
You've got 87 to 100 with the 2,4-D versus 69 to 93, so you can still see some value there. But you get to the seven-day pre-plant, and it's essentially a wash. So it kind of depends how long you're going to leave the cover in. I think our conclusion largely, though, is um, the cover does substitute for the, for the fall herbicide application, right? Having said that, um, here's another site we had up at Loudonville, um, right, which, which where the, uh, again, what you see with the fall 2,4-D is, uh, essentially no difference. It's kind of a wash regardless of whether we had the cover in there or not. Um, did I skip a slide? No, I didn't. Um, but what, what was interesting about this study was um, if you looked at the whole thing, the, the plus and minus residual, um, the only place we, we got decent control was essentially early April application of herbicides. It didn't have that much to do, I think, with um, when we killed the cover as much as that we just had to apply that early to get control of the mare's tail that were there. So you see... Uh, no cover plus early April application with residual 100%, early April uh, kill where we had to cover 100%, and the best we had anywhere else was 82%. So kind of, kind of uh, conflicting data. I think our conclusions, though, were um, the cover crop can improve control when integrated with a decent herbicide system, and, and delaying the kill of the cover until closer to planting helps that control. Um, having said that, we did have the Loudonville site where delaying the kill of the whole thing uh, reduced our mare's tail control. Probably allows emission of the fall applied foliar herbicides. Um, we wouldn't recommend that you leave out the residual herbicides. You could possibly go to a less comprehensive mix. And again, the bottom line on use of cover crops is they don't change the basic principles um, of mare's tail control or control of other weeds in spite of the fact that they can help your herbicide program work better, I think. Um, if you've seen this, this is something Purdue originated and then all of us sort of signed on on this. It's like a four-page fact sheet that um, covers really the basics. It's, it's very basic in terms of weed control, I think what? Entomology, what else is in there? Insect control, diseases, and, and relative to covers. There is some misinformation about covers that gets spread around. One of the pieces of misinformation about covers that gets spread with relative to weed control is that covers can replace herbicides, uh, herbicide program for control of weeds, which is largely untrue. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through the four things that Bill Johnson put together on weed control that uh, we basically agree with, and that is terminate the cover crop before planting. Don't leave it in later. It gets more difficult. You run out of options. Uh, having said that, you already heard me say that when to terminate a cover crop, I think, can be very site and environment specific. Choose the right cover crop. And I have to tell you the history here is that uh, what Bill had in there initially was don't use annual ryegrass. Um, and that unleashed sort of a torrent of stuff on him over in Indiana uh, that I can't probably describe. Um, annual ryegrass, I think, for mare's tail, for example, is a good cover crop. It makes weed scientists very nervous. Some of you have, have experienced some of the, these problems with annual ryegrass compared to, like, a cereal rye. Tougher to kill if it's cold in the spring. Certainly going to take more glyphosate always uh, than cereal rye. It's very slow to die in some cases. Uh, the weed scientists in the south flat out will not recommend annual ryegrass, and their reason is they already have some Italian ryegrass down there, and they're concerned about... Um, glyphosate resistance, the development of glyphosate resistance in that. So that's some things to consider before you plant annual ryegrass. The data that weed scientists have would show it's not any better at suppressing weeds than, than cereal rye. Cereal rye is still at the top in terms of, of uh, what, what can suppress weeds. Um, don't reduce herbicide use. I think, I think there's some caveats to that, right? So that kind of comes back to the you may get some help from the cover crop. It's variable, and that makes, that makes weed scientists nervous in terms of making a recommendation because we've all seen how one year we get a lot of help from it, one year we possibly don't. Having said that, um, you know, I, I mentioned for mare's tail, for example, they're maybe omitting the fall 2,4-D application because you have a cover, I think, especially if that cover is well-established early in the fall, and then possibly not needing quite as comprehensive a residual herbicide mix. So I think you kind of have to, you know, there's some caveats to that. But again, don't rely on cover crops for universal Weed suppression. And I would just tell you, I, I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, this cover crop will control your weeds, that they're pretty much full of it, right? Um, it can help. So some generalities on killing the cover, and I'll kind of stop after a couple of slides, because this is the other thing that, that sort of comes up. I do have some other slides in here that are specific to certain covers, and, uh, and I think this slide was initially put together by Kevin Bradley down in Missouri, and I sort of stole it. But proper herbicide timing is important. Um, smaller is generally better for controlling covers. Having said that, there are some exceptions like hairy vetch, which is easier to kill when, as it gets larger and older, right? You can practically run over it with something and kill it, right? 
Um, but size is certainly one issue. Weather is another one. I'm not sure it's on the next slide, but for a species like annual ryegrass, temperature is everything, right? You can, you can spray it when it's four inches tall under cold conditions, come back and have very slow kill, come back a week later when it's 70 degrees or 80 degrees or whatever, and it'll go down very fast. So uh, species that are likely to winter kill, if that's what you're looking for, tillage, radish, and oats. Species that have proven more difficult to control, wheat, crimson, clover, annual ryegrass, right? And species fairly easy to control, cereal rye, Austrian winter pea, hairy veg. Um, I think it's hard to get away from glyphosate when you're trying to kill a cover. I mean, you can try to swap in some paraquat, and it's possible to do that. Uh, some germoxone for certain covers. Um, there, there are ways to make that work depending on how you mix it. But for a lot of, a lot of covers, it's, it's very difficult to get away from glyphosate. Doesn't need help on grasses. Obviously, it's going to have to go with some 2,4-D or dicamba or clopyrrolid for legumes. Um, Liberty, even though the prices come down, um, Liberty is generally not a good choice. It's not good enough on perennial weeds really to make it fit in that situation. You could probably put enough 2,4-D or something with it to help, help out on legumes. If you are going to try to use that, it works best with atrazine, warm, sunny weather, again, like the ryegrass that responds to warm weather. Um, and, of course, you have some post options. So depending on what trait you're using, you've got the option to come back with glyphosate post-emergence and then increasingly the use of 2,4-D and dicamba uh, in soybeans. And I'm going to stop there. I will come back to this point here about the clopyrrolid, that anytime you've got legumes out there, especially the clover and the alfalfa, which can be tough to kill, if you can get a product in there in your burn-down residual that has clopyrrolid, that will make your life considerably easier.